everyone, and welcome to Life Hacks for Working Moms, the podcast that helps you overcome the overwhelm, embrace the chaos, and cultivate a life you love. My name is Megan Strand, and it's an honor to be here with you today. Thanks so much for tuning in. If you have a kiddo that's into sports, like I do, you're going to want to pay close attention today because I have a guest that may very well change the way your family approaches those sports activities. John O'Sullivan has been involved in soccer full-time as a player and coach since 1996. He's now an international speaker and national best-selling author of a great book called Changing the Game, The Parent's Guide to Raising Happy, High-Performing Athletes. Welcome, John. Thanks for having me on, Megan. I appreciate it. Why don't we just jump right in and have you start out by sharing why you felt compelled to write this book? Well, I, I, as you said, I'd been involved as a, as a player and, and a college player, a pro player, and then a coach on every level from youth all the way up through Division One college. And I, as, once I became a dad and started looking at things from a little bit of a different perspective... It really hit home that, man, sports is not like it used to be when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. And so I was looking for uh, an educational program for parents and coaches in my club that I was running, and I couldn't find it. So I said, well, let me uh, do the research and write the book myself, and here you go. (laughs) Why why Um, did you feel the need to – I mean, you said you kind of went looking for educational programs. So was there something that made you sit up and go, huh? This isn't. This doesn't seem right. Yeah, and I don't think definitely. I don't. I don't think if you talk to any parent these days and you say who played sports when they were growing up and you say how is it different for your kids, everyone nods their head. There's so much more pressure. There's so much more misinformation out there. And what do you do? The costs are higher. The commitments are higher. And people just feel like, oh, my kids don't just get to play sports anymore. It's all about practice and private coaches and this and that. And so this is what I was seeing. And what I was seeing was people thought that the way to help a a child perform their best, regardless of talent, was that they were going to get them lots of practice and lots of training and drive them towards becoming a college star or whatever. And, And that's not how it works. First, you have to instill a love of the game and the experience has to belong to the kids. And so I saw the experience basically being stolen from the kids. Mm. And I saw a lot of parents looking for 98% of parents, I think are fantastic. They love their kids. They want to help, but we weren't teaching them how to help. And so I was looking for something saying, okay, how do you help? How do you help your kids? That makes sense. Well, and part of what's driving a lot of this, according to your book, or at least it seemed like it to me when I read it, was college scholarships. And there's a little bit of a myth around the elusive college scholarship. Can you talk a little bit about the statistics that you found? Sure. Well, basically, there's this myth that if you specialize the first time your kid hits a layup or scores a goal, and then you get on the winning team and make cuts and form all-star teams as soon as possible, that all this time and all this investment is going to pay off in the form of a scholarship. And it might, but what the statistics say from the NCA is that really only uh, less than 3% of all high school athletes play a college sport. And of that, only a very small number get a scholarship. And I think the average athletic award these days is about $11,000 a year. So basically, sports can be an investment in a lot of things. But the idea that you're going to get back all this time or and all that or all this money that you might have spent on sports in the form of an athletic scholarship, it's not a very good bet. Well, and the other piece of that whole statistic that I thought was interesting was that what are the numbers of parents who think their kids are getting <laughs> yeah, a scholarship? I've, I've seen numbers anywhere from 30 to 50 percent of high school parents think their kids in line for a scholarship, especially yeah. if they're playing on high level club sports. And, and again, it doesn't mean that, that a kid's not going to get one. But if that's the only reason that they're in sport, that's that's not really a great reason because they could get hurt. They could just decide it's not for them anymore. Use sports to teach character, to surround your kid with great role models, to teach him to overcome challenges. But you know, using it as an investment tool is, is not a very safe investment tool. <laughs> well, the other thing you talk about is that there are a, a very high percentage of kids that drop out of youth sports by, what is it, age 13, something like that? Yeah, I mean, the numbers you see from the National Alliance of Youth Sports are about 
three out of four. It's I think it's seventy percent. And yes, kids drop out of sports because think about it, it's high school. School gets harder. They get jobs. They get boyfriends. They get girlfriends. But realistically, a lot of really really good players drop out as well. It's not just the kids who get cut. Mm-hmm. There's the top athletes who for many years have just been driven so hard and never have had a weekend off in the summer because they've always been at baseball tournaments or soccer tournaments that get to high school and say, you know what, I I want my childhood. It's almost over. And so they they walk away. And what we teach at the Change the Game Project is not that competitive sports is bad. Competitive sports is awesome. I've spent my whole life in competitive sports. But there's a way to do competitive sports that helps your kids play their best and lets them be kids as well. Well, let's talk a little bit about that. So if we shouldn't be focused on scholarships, which I totally agree with, um, what are the other things we should be focused on as parents? Well, I think, first of all, as a parent, realizing that any athlete or anyone in any achievement activity, be it playing an instrument or art or whatever, they need three things. They need autonomy. So they need to own the experience. They need enjoyment and they need intrinsic motivation. And without those three things, sports or music, it falls apart. They quit. They walk away. Right. And so I think as a parent, always going back to do they have those three things? Are they having fun? Now, it doesn't mean every day is fun. It doesn't mean <laughs> that they have to love doing fitness. But but do they want to be out there? Do they come home and pick up a ball and play extra does the experience belong to them? If you're saying we struck out 10 batters, no, you didn't. Your, your son did. <laughs> That's a bad sign that you're not giving them ownership of the experience and you're not following, you know, pursuing their goals. And, and then again, intrinsic motivation. If they are motivated to get better, they're going to practice more. They're going to do the things that will get them to the next level. If you're the only one forcing them to be out there over and over and over, Yes, you can do that with your kids because you're a parent, but they're eventually going to walk away and it can be potentially really damaging to them. Yeah, that's interesting. So I have a daughter, she's quite the little athlete and she's, she's done a number of different sports over the years. And it, you know, it, she, I found with her that she kind of needs to do multiple sports because she gets burned out really, really easily. Mm-hmm. Um, but there are definitely parents that are like, no, you gotta, you know, you gotta do the five day a week competition or whatever. So, I mean, how, how, how kid directed can this be at certain ages? Cause I definitely with my daughter, she loves soccer. She loves track, but there are definitely days that she's like, I don't want to go to practice. Mm, that's a great question. So obviously that's very age dependent. Now, all the science, all the research that I read talks about the benefits. Unless you you have a daughter who's a gymnast or a figure skater or a diver who is trying to become an Olympian, mm-hmm. all the research says that specializing in one sport prior to the age of 12 is does not – lead to long-term success very often and often leads to a whole host of issues, 70 to 90% more injuries and all that sort of stuff. So I think if your child is prior to middle school, giving them lots of opportunities to play different sports. And even if they really, really love one sport, I tell parents, you know, my seven-year-old really, really loves mac and cheese, but he can't have (laughs) dinner every night. (laughs) And so as a parent, you have to, you have to, and say, I know you love this, but it's also important to take time off because that's what the doctors say. Um, so let's find something else. Now, like my kids, my kids love to play soccer. And of course, they've been around it forever. But right now, my daughter loves gymnastics. Mm. She comes home and does headstands and cartwheels and flips <laughs> and this and that, back walkovers. I mean, that's all she does all the time. And that's what I would call not specialization in a sport, that's engagement. It's completely child-driven and she is loving it. Now, as your kids get older, as they get into middle school and high school, if they say, I want to go all in on soccer, this is the passion that I'm pursuing, I think that's okay. I think you, it's as long as it is 100% their decision and you support that. Now, they still need time off. They still would benefit greatly by doing something like yoga tumbling, judo, or any sort of martial arts, these things that teach them to move their body and move different parts of their body. Um, And if your kid says, you know what, I want to play a couple of sports in high school, 
then support that as well. I mean, I've coached Division One soccer players who went all in on soccer. And I've coached, I, I re- recently coached a girl who got 12 varsity letters in high school. She oh played four years of varsity in, in three different sports. Well, that's great. Well, and it's great that the coaches allowed her to do that because there, as you said, there is a lot of pressure to specialize. And when you're playing year round soccer or whatever it is, it makes it hard to, to be able to play another sport. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about family goals. You have a system that you say you should really sit down as a family and figure out what your goals are. What does that mean? Well, what I call it in the book is a, a family youth sports mission statement. What is the role and purpose of sports for your family? And I think this is really important because you always want to know where you're going, right? Your, your golf game might be like mine and there's the hole and here's the tee and you don't you, – you go far from directly there. You're on the right. You're on the left. You're behind a tree. You're in the bunker. But eventually you know where you're going and I think – sports is the same thing in school we have that you know we have a curriculum we we know what we want out of it we know what we want our kids to to look like and the base of knowledge they're supposed to have when they graduate well i think far too often in sports we don't put enough time and effort into thinking well what is the purpose of sports and what happens in that situation is maybe your family has certain values that that are not being represented by a coach and yet we throw our kids in with that coach because he or she wins all their games well that's not really a good thing because the wins those memories fade away but the role model is what sticks and so if you don't if you are putting your kids in organizations or with coaches that don't meet what your family stands for then sports is having a detrimental effect and people say oh it's just sports it's not just sports it's not you, – you can't just erase a bad experience or being with a bully coach or someone who demeans your child or teaches them how to cheat or to be dishonest. I mean those those are life lessons. <laughs> right, right. Well, and you gave a great example of a girl whose family decided together, I think, that they wanted sports to be all about self-esteem for her and mm-hmm. self-confidence. And so, you know, seeing her kind of stay in a game at a time that she might have faked an injury or asked to be pulled out, that Mm -hmm. was success for them. And who cares? They don't even, I don't even know if she won the game or not. I don't remember, but that was the, that was their goal for her, their, their daughter. And I just love that. Yeah. And it's, it's such a, I think a, a great example of that's what they decided. Now, if our child learns that and goes and plays in college, well, great. That's, that's icing on the cake, but it's not the cake. One of the things that I read, I think it was just over this past weekend that I loved was you were talking about the car ride home after a game from the kid's perspective. And I just, I am so guilty of having done this before. (laughs) Can you talk a little about what that is? Sure. And why we should totally not do it. (laughs) Yeah. So I, um, and this is something I learned. There's an amazing organization actually out of Seattle, Washington called Proactive Coaching. And the man who founded that is named Bruce Brown. And I saw him speak about 10 years ago, which really changed my life as a coach and as a dad. And one of the things that Bruce talks about is this car ride home, that when they've done exit interviews with athletes and ask them, what is your worst (laughs) sports memory? Most kids say the ride home after the game. Because when you think about it, this is a time when they're physically and emotionally exhausted And they just need to unwind. And yet we've got them locked in the car. They're not going anywhere. We've got guaranteed FaceTime. And so we choose this to criticize and critique their performance or how bad Jenny was today or what was your coach thinking playing so-and-so in that position. And what the kids tell us is that this is probably the least teachable moment, not the most teachable moment. Hmm. Well, and what what do kids say that they get out of sports? Wow, I mean, we could talk about that one for an hour. I think, <laughs> I think every every kid says something different, but certainly, when you ask children what they remember about sports mm-hmm. when they're graduating high school, when they're going off to college, they don't remember winning the U eleven Super Duper Elite Cup championship. They remember the hotel. 
They remember <laughs> the van ride with their teammates. They remember celebrating someone's birthday at Applebee's. Uh, those are the things that that kids remember. And they also remember the the role models that they were surrounded with. Now, as a parent, putting your uh, – you know, I, I always say this, and I've worked with so many families of kids of all ages. I have rarely, if ever, met a teenager that at one point – thought that their parents weren't totally ignorant and didn't want to listen to them anymore. Right. Right. This happens. And so this is why I think sports is so great because during that period, if, if you know that they have a, a great coach who is leading them down the right path and they trust that coach and they're going to confide in that coach, you know, that for that time until they realize that actually you do know something and you're not that dumb after all <laughs> that, that they're in good hands. Right. And so, this is what this is why I think sport is so important that they will remember those lessons. Now they might not always appreciate them at the time, having a coach who pushes them, who makes them uncomfortable, who gets them out of their comfort zone, who demands more of them than anyone's ever demanded before. But I can pretty much guarantee when they look back years later, they're grateful for that coach, just like probably you and I are grateful for a tough teacher who didn't let us slide by. Absolutely. Can you talk a little bit about the long-term athletic development framework? I'd never heard of this before. And you give an example that's somewhat mortifying of this kid playing soccer and, you know, going to the highest levels in a bunch of different leagues and systems. And the kid has like no free time to himself whatsoever because he's so good and he's playing all the time. Um, And it seems like that went counter to the long-term athletic development framework. Can you talk about what that is? Sure. So um, long-term athletic development is a, a model that was actually developed by a group of scientists in Canada. And if people are interested uh, on my website, changethegameproject.com, there's a brief overview of it or oh, the book, obviously. Um, but basically, it, it's a framework of, well, what is the what what is the purpose of sport? And the purpose of sport is to keep people active for life. And then what are the different phases that children go through in sport and, and when do they get need to get more serious about practicing to really do their best to play at an elite level? And when do things like winning really start to matter? And, and what the model says is that, you know, really up through age nine, there is – it's all about mo- learning what we would call physical literacy – movement skills, the ability to run and jump and move your body. It's a learned skill, just like reading is a learned skill. Some kids pick it up quickly. Some kids don't. And then um, you, you start getting into these ages of skill development and learning to train properly. But really competition in this model doesn't start to matter until the middle to the late teenage years. Hmm. So when we're – when we are um, – putting so much emphasis on how our nine-year-old's team is doing, we're going really against all the science about how to develop players because you can set up your team to win when they're nine years old, but it's not necessarily setting them up for long-term success. And then another big part of it, you reference the the player I talk about in my book, is this idea of periodization, mm-hmm. is that you cannot be competing at the extreme level week in and week out. You should build towards events and and taper off. And what happens with our elite young athletes in the United States especially is that they get asked to be on multiple teams and multiple all-star teams and Olympic development programs and this and that. And so they go from week to week of, quote, the most important week weekend of the year. Right. They never get to taper off. They never get to cut back on training. And pretty soon – Every moment is gone. Now, there's great coaches there. The programs are great. But because there's not a single developmental model looking out for the best interest of the child, it's just different entities competing for that child's time and money. What happens is those kids get injured and and they get burned out and they actually become worse players because – they're always playing tired. And if you're playing tired, you're not completing as many, you're not moving as fast, you're not completing as many actions per minute. So you're actually learning to play slow when you play tired all the time. Hmm. Interesting. Well, that's fascinating. I will definitely put a link to that in the show notes on your site. 
Well, we're getting toward the end of our time, but if you could share one piece of advice with every parent of a young athlete, what would that be? I think that the most important thing you you can do is is remember that you have a child, you know, and it's their identity has to be as a full, well balanced person. So if you all you ever talk about and all you ever do is play baseball or play soccer, pretty soon you have um, Johnny the baseball player not Johnny, the guy who plays baseball and fishes and likes to camp and has all these friends and plays piano. And so you have to be very cognizant, I think, as a parent that you're raising a balanced person who values school and values friends and values church and values all the things that your family values. Because if they become all about one thing and you get sucked into that as well, then when they get hurt or when that one thing ends, what do they have? And someone said this to me the other day, and I think it's very, very true, and I'm very cognizant of this with my children as well. How many parents out there, because their kids do well at sports or play a travel sport, is 90% 90 of your conversation with your child can very often become about sports or maybe a combination of school and sports? Well, what happens when those things are done? And then you look up and you realize that you have nothing in common with your son or your daughter. Mm. That's a really scary thought. That was a really scary thought for me. Right. And so my wife and I make a very big effort to, to find other interests that are lifelong interests. Maybe it's camping. Maybe it's fishing. Maybe it's skiing. Maybe it's whatever that, that um, you know, art, it's, it's reading. It's these different things that, you know – once once sport is done, once school is done, we want there to be a huge amount of relationship left over. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, that's a perfect, perfect place to end, John. Thank you so, so much for sharing these fantastic tips. And it's it's absolutely worth your while to check out John's book, Changing the Game. I will put a link to it in the show notes. And in the meantime, John, if people want to find out more about you or the Changing the Game project, how might they do that online? So changingthegameproject.com is my website, and that's a great way to connect with me and hook up with uh, my blog. I only write a blog every two or three weeks, but try to just give some good information. You can also jump on my Facebook page there as well or Twitter if that's what uh, that's what you do. And then you're going to put a link to my book, but you can also find that at any bookstore or on Amazon or barnesnoble.com, pals, all, all the normal places that you might find a book. Excellent. Thank you so, so much, John. And of course, you can find Life Hacks for Working Moms on iTunes. I do recommend you subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss an episode. Or you can hit the website at lh, the number four, wm.com. And on behalf of John and myself, we'd like to thank you so, so much for tuning in today. And I'll talk to you next time.